Silicon Valley is insane. And by Silicon Valley, I really mean all the tech companies with other tech hubs like Boston and Seattle and I don't know, Austin, Texas and all other places. Uh, but yeah, Silicon Valley is freaking crazy. And they say, it, you know, I live in Silicon Valley. I live, you know, in San Francisco Bay Area. I work for a tech company. And to some extent, I get to reap the benefits of this insanity by having a good job, close to home, making good money. But on the flip side, I'm also, you know, I, I came to Bay Area in 2001, uh, in June 2001, right after the dot-com uh, boom and bust. And, um, you know, I didn't come here for money. I didn't come here to pursue a fancy job, you know, get two weeks of some course like it was possible back then and make a lot of money. I came here because, uh, you know, we we're immigrating to the United States and the only friends that my family had were here uh, and they were offered to help us in the first, you know, uh, couple of months, you know, help us rent our first apartment, that sort of thing. And that's why I ended up here. And now my mother is here, my sister is here. Um, at the time, you know, I moved away, I joined the military, I got out, I came back here because my grandma was also here to help out with that. Um, so I'm kind of here, not because of the Bay Area or Silicon Valley or the jobs, I'm just kind of here uh, because my family is here. And uh, so I kind of have the two perspectives on these things, you know, I kind of can see it as a tech person, but I also can see it as a person who lives here. And, you know, it's just crazy, like Silicon Valley is crazy. I actually generally don't understand, well, I understand, logically I understand why it's here, but um, I'm also surprised that, you know, more companies are not moving out because it's so expensive here. Um, but you know the main reason they're here is because most of the investors are here. I believe like half half the all investment startups are being done in this area. So you take all the investments being done, take half of it, drop in this tiny you know geographical area, and take the other half and sprinkle it throughout the United States. Uh, so that's why they're all here because they come here for money and then they kind of settle down and they stay. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. But uh, you know, it's definitely feels bubbly. Uh, it's been feeling bubbly for a few years for sure. Uh, uh, there's a great book that I recommend called Disrupted, My Disadventure in the Startup Bubble. Um, it's written by a, you know, a, you know, pretty, you know, professional journalist basically who's been around for a while. He's one of the authors for Silicon Valley, the show, the comedy show about Silicon Valley. So you kind of get like this kind of funny, um, sort of like piece of his biography autobiography that he he worked for a startup and he was just like shocked by everything that he saw and i definitely can relate it was a very eye-opening book for me like it kind of like verbalized a lot of things that i felt uh kind of kind of intuitively was uh concerned about uh but yeah let me talk about that so you know basically the the i believe one of the driving factors for that as i mentioned it's investor money and the reason we have so much investor money floating around in general uh, in the United States is because uh, the interest rates are really low so if you have money you rich person with money you need to do something with money otherwise you're just losing value sitting there you have to invest it or it's you know losing value right and uh, since the interest rate is so low there's really not that many places you can invest other than speculating on the startup um, so they have so the you know the venture capitalists are able to raise all these funds they have to invest all these funds in somewhere most of it's been invested here in san francisco bay area as i mentioned earlier so it creates this environment where you know this race to the bottom at the same time people who live here uh who own houses here who you know people who get to vote and pass on most of the laws uh they really fight hard to keep this craziness of taking over. And I, I don't really, can't really blame them as somebody who has been living here for a while. It is insane, like, you know, you live, you moved here in 2001, it was fairly mild, 2004, it was fairly mild, 2007, eight, it was kind of recession, it was pretty good times. And then all of a sudden, you know, things are booming again and you have all these, you know, rents, um, you know, the two bedroom waterfront apartment in the Foster City, California, where I live, I mean, it's a nice place, but it's not like, you know, it's still like 30 minutes out of San Francisco. Uh, it used to cost in 2007 when I got out of the military for front work from apartment it was $1,800 my friend used to rent it for two bedroom apartment today it's pushing 4,000 it's more than doubled uh, it's been like what less than 10 years I'm about 10 years I guess 11 uh, 
and you know salaries did the same salaries basically tech salaries doubled in this period of time so they kind of trying to catch up with that uh, but you always pay the stupid tax as i call it because uh, you you according to federal uh, laws you're wealthy according to uh, uh you know state laws you, you basically get taxed on your income as well so you you know you pay like a significant tax all your credits go away because you make so much money uh, uh you know that you supposedly don't need it but hey you know my rent for the cheapest two-bedroom apartment in foster city and i have a family of you know two kids and a wife so you know i probably need a two-bedroom and actually i legally required to have a two-bedroom uh because we have four people by the county laws um that place is um uh it cost me three thousand dollars a month it's the cheapest place i can find uh we have no we don't have our own laundry you have to go somewhere else to do laundry three thousand dollars a month over 12 months over 30 years that's a million dollars so just going down the drain for living here you know i have family in las vegas nevada you know maybe not the most family friendly place but you can rent a, like a luxury two bedroom uh apartment for about two grand i mean you know what we pay here it would be a mortgage on a really nice house almost anywhere in the united states but here it's just crappy two bedroom in a decent area but honestly it's it's like that anyway you're probably not gonna get it's it's that's actually a good deal uh it's it should be more uh, almost anywhere you go um so yeah so that's 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 sort of like living and being here but also like there's a flip like the other side of the metal is the all these tech companies they're kind of insane like they're 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 able to raise this money and they just kind of like throw it away and one of the big things they throw it away on is the real estate like so they have to pay high salaries to people afford to rent here with crazy rents and they also have to pay this uh, high leasing costs and everybody wants to stay here in this fear of missing out and they all kind of have roots and it's easier and then there's a lot of talent here because all this like ecosystem of startups so you know nobody wants to leave and it's just insane and then there's no housing being built for the most part because people who live here fighting against new development and i understand why they do that because it's been crazy you know we have shopping mall another shopping mall turned down they build more houses traffic is congested it's just like not a healthy environment and uh yeah so that's that and did i mention i don't think i did peter thiel said that you know every time he gives money to somebody in silicon valley he just feels like he takes his money and just like uh, siphons that are distributed between landlords in the area because it all goes to the rent, high salaries, and the leasing uh, of the apartments. I mean, uh, of the office buildings. So that's that. And there's, you know, startups, they're either really like, I guess they're spoiled with like raising money. Like the main focus is not, has, has not been for a while profitability, it's growth. Everybody wants to grow. Uh, show us the growth like we don't care how we get the growth numbers as long as we have the good numbers the user base is growing we can you can go public with this crap like you don't have to be profitable to go public and people like buy your stock for a lot of money because you have a lot of users but like that only makes sense so far like in some cases maybe like for example twitter twitter went public without ever being profitable it barely like i guess did something lately that they, they finally were able to turn a profit after like 20 years of existence or something whatever not 20 but you know what i mean uh, uh yeah and that's and you know actually the book that i recommend disrupted really digs into that and this it's a good point and i see it in the small startups as soon as they make revenue instead of making profitable and like you know putting money out for a rainy day they just go out and like raise more and buy and spend get bigger offices get like whatever uh you know just wasting hiring people they don't need you know all this crap uh uh yeah i mean like i i don't get it. i'm old-fashioned so I, I you know i'd like to have a savings i like to have a security blanket i like to be profitable i mean to me it's the ultimate goal is to be profitable right like have a business that's profitable that's cool to me uh, having a business that you know you know makes 10 million but spends 12 i mean whatever you know like look at uber like uber subsidizing you know it's running taxi companies out of existence by subsidizing rides below of what it should cost right if you're running a business for profit uh like you want to if you're driving a cab back in the day before uber and i love uber like it's super convenient don't get me wrong but uh it's also kind of there is a flip side to that right like back in back in the day you can come to america drive a cab no education or nothing and make good living right 
Uh, today it's not the case. Uh, Uber, and I specifically was told that when I interviewed there a long time ago. I have an article I can link to that. They they don't compete with uh, taxi companies. They compete with Walmart for workers. You know, basically, if people can make a minimum wage, they get the freedom, which is great, of working on their own hours. But you know, they make their own wage. They pay basically all the expenses. So once you expense the vehicle costs, blah blah blah, you'll get a minimum wage type of deal. Um, great if you're in the right. Not great if you you know try to make a living. I mean, and it's. I guess it's cool, like if you just, you know, for people that just like jump in the car and I want to make a few extra dollars and I want to make my own schedule, it's cool, but uh, it's not sustainable, all right? Like it's because I, I don't, Uber is pretty sure losing money, so I'm pretty sure they're subsidizing some of that with their investor money, right? So they basically, you know, every time I take an Uber drive, right, and say it cost me $20, it should cost me $40, but the difference is paid by investor money. And Uber is just one example, easy to pick on. I actually used to be like a, kind of against Uber. I feel after they made some changes in leadership and stuff like that, they're basically as back to like being as any other company. So I don't, wanna, I don't like picking on companies just because it's cool to pick on them. I just like to call out things that I think are wrong. And if they fix them, I want to give them credit for it. So I think Uber is actually in the better place. I don't know what they do now. I don't know what their vision is now. The information I provided is outdated information with the old CEO, which I didn't like as a person. I think a lot of people didn't, uh, but you know, he did amazing things still, you know, maybe what, it, you know, that kind of personality was, was what needed to basically disrupt this market and prove that you can like have this thing you press the button and it shows up at the door so that I means it's amazing he gets credit for that but he was kind of a shady guy so I, you know i don't really appreciate that about him uh you know create pre unhealthy environment for people who work for this company and i also you know i question this whole yeah drivers do it they have the freedom to do it you know i'm for free market but at the same time uh the the, the fact that the investor money is subsidizing this uh, ride at the below market cost, below of profitable cost. That's the part that bothers me, right? I want to. I like businesses that are real businesses. Like they don't need influx of, you know, like the IV of cash from investors that can actually sustain. They, they create enough value to pay all their bills, pay their pay their employees, and still be around. So this video is turning to be really long. I apologize, but uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. But basically, yeah, like uh, the investors' money, people like startups just spending like crazy not worrying about profitability and the reason they no, don't worry can get away with not worrying about profitability is because they have an exit strategy uh, not acquisition but going public you know there's you know disrupted uh book gives a lot of examples uh, of pub companies that went public without ever being profitable uh and you know there's countless examples i'm not gonna list them but uh, the book has them you can google it and you know the point is they don't go profitable because investors, I mean, and I mean private investors, you know, people who buy stock, public stock, public traded stock, they don't reward companies who do well, at least in tech market. I, I don't think it's as crazy in any other industry. Like, I can't imagine somebody buying a stock of a steel company um, that doesn't make a profit. Like, you know, I mean, they probably buy it, but like at a discounted rate, blah, blah, blah. Like, imagine like say, oh yeah, we have a, publicly you know have a company that sells beef uh we actually lose 20 cents for every dollar of sales that we make you know we make you know every dollar we make costs a dollar 20 uh of expenses but go ahead and go buy our stock you know so like every dollar you give us uh you you know you lose money and nobody would do that but public uh uh, technical company happens all the time. You, you know, their operating costs, they make 100 million of revenue, and the, the, the operating costs will be 150 million. So they're basically losing $50 million every year, and people go out and buy their stocks for, you know, $50 or something like that. And, uh, I mean, I don't get it. Uh, but, you know, those people show growth and they, you know, hack their way to doing whatever it takes, you know, subsidizing where we need to subsidize to show the user growth, uh, attraction, all that stuff. So that's the world we live in. Uh, is it sustainable long term? I believe it's not. Um, but hey, I've, it's been going for a while now, and I felt like we were in a bubble for a while. So for all I know, I'm wrong. I'm full of crap. Uh, things are great. They're doing the right things. I'm freaking full of crap. I don't know, but that's my take on it. Uh, take it for what it's worth. 
Thank you for listening. I apologize. Like my video has been getting longer. I just ramble on. I really apologize. I feel like I'm still saying things that mean and mean something and make sense in the context of what I'm messaging. So I apologize for length. But uh, nobody's watching this videos anyway. So you know, I figure I'll just you know let it have it as it as it comes out of me. So thank you for listening. If you made it this far, I don't know who you are, but I appreciate it. And uh, till next time.